rank and they're telling me that they can't hear me.
welcome everyone. Good to see everybody and welcome everybody online. Glad to have you as the church gathers today. We're going to have a message entitled, When They Go Against God, because that's what's happening in the book of Acts. When people go against the Lord, His people, and the gospel, here's how to respond so that we can be faithful to the Lord. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. So this is about 10 years after the birth of the church. It was at this time Herod arrested some. So he had James, the brother of John, you know, the two sons of thunder, put to death with the sword. This is the first apostle that was martyred for the faith. James was one of the intimates of Jesus. You know, Peter, James, and John. And so the church knew this. This is, this is not James, the Lord's brother, that wrote, wrote the book of James, but this is James, the brother of John. Now, when he saw that this met, when Herod saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. That's a pilgrim festival where Jews from all over the world have come to Jerusalem. Now, after arresting him, Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover, after the Passover. Sound familiar? Let's pray together. Father, in this day in which we live, there's persecution happening all over the world. And dear Lord, we pray that when we encounter it, that we would remember the gospel witness of your faithful followers in the book of Acts, let's remember James, who gave his life, Lord, because he was sharing the gospel with those in Jerusalem and in Judea, just like you, you commanded. Let's remember Peter, who was imprisoned. Let's remember all the saints. Lord, who stand as a witness for us about how to live in a world that has opposition in it to the truth so that we too may be seen as being faithful in our day. Help us to be shaped by your word, not our own understanding, please, dear Lord, so that we may not be lost. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, in... Acts chapter 12, James is martyred, Peter is jailed, and then we see the church gathers, miracles happen, and the gospel spreads. You see, nothing is going to stop God. No weapon formed against him or his people shall prosper. God's work continued to flourish. And so what can we learn? Number one, Tertullian was the first to notice this. He was a second century church father, and he wrote, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. The church grows during persecution. The church is refined when we are opposed. And this doesn't happen automatically. It only happens if you're faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and to respond like they respond to opposition when it happens. You see, um, God's Word is going to go forth um, as a witness to the nations of the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And when the rulers that exist in the world try to stop that, if they use force, it's only going to embolden the church and when the church stands in the truth and stands in love and stands in courage and stands with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now that is a compelling witness 
And that's what caused many people to come to faith in Christ is that witness. And so this is what we are to learn. When believers are persecuted for their faith without being mad and upset at the world, then it is a powerful witness. Why do you think it's not such a good witness if somebody's being persecuted? Let's say they're being martyred and shaking their fist at those martyring. Why is that not a good witness? Why does that work against the gospel? They're there shaking their fist. Or they're just being upset like the two thieves on either side of Jesus. We're just heaping abuse on Jesus, right? Heaping abuse on both of them were. One was converted, though, when they saw that Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus wasn't shaking his fist at Pilate. No, Jesus willingly, according to the will of God, endured that. Jesus was testifying to the truth and doing it in love. How about Stephen, the first martyr? Was he upset with the world, with the Jewish authorities? Folks, when he was given testimony of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, what did his face look like? Did his face look like it was upset? No, it looked like the face of an angel. That's the way we're describing it. And then what did he do at the very end of his life, right after they stoned him, right as they were stoned him, stoning him, what did he do? He prayed and asked God to forgive them, you see. That's the compelling witness that people saw around him, around James, around Jesus, and were converted. And so martyrdom, the blood of martyrs, is the seed of growth in the church. And God used it, and God uses it today all over the world. Now, here's their attitude. What's their attitude? That this world is not their home. They've got a tourist visa, but they do not have citizenship papers, and they are in this world on business. It's a workplace for them and not a home. This is a workplace. They're here on the master's business. They've been kept here for a purpose. That purpose is to serve the eternal kingdom of God, and they're just passing through. You ever heard those songs like, I'm just a pilgrim passing through? You know, it's it's not... A destination. This world is not a destination. It is not a home. And that's the attitude they had. And so they're not upset with the world for taking away from them what they don't have anyway. I mean, they lost that when they, when they, and here's another effect of persecution. It purifies the church. Persecution purifies the church. There's no easy believism in the church. It's all in or no in. And so therefore, everybody in the church knew that they, to profess their faith in Jesus and to be a witness is to put their lives at risk. Just imagine this. Um, If you're living for your home in this world, would you put your kids at risk? Let me ask you, parents, would you put your kids at risk by having them profess their faith openly and publicly in the Lord Jesus. Would you do that? If you're living for this life, you won't. But here's the teaching of Jesus. If you love your life in this world, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. You'll save it. That's the word. So you got to make a decision when you're in an environment of being persecuted. And they did, and that's why we call it the seed of the church. Because people, when they saw this witness, they knew that these people believed. They knew that this meant something for them to give up the world because they believe in Jesus. To have Jesus is better than silver or gold. We sing it, they lived it, you see. That meant that they were a personal testimony to that. And so down through the ages, we see faithfulness to Christ in those who were called to give up their life for him. Now, folks, 
you know, this, this absolutely goes with the teaching of Jesus. You can't be my disciple unless you take up your what? And follow me. You've got to be willing to lay down your life. Whoever's ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of them when I come in my Father's glory. But if you profess me before men, I'll profess you before my heavenly Father. So therefore, when men are opposed to the truth, it's called upon. It'll bring it out in you. It's a clarifying moment. Do you believe? It's a gut check. So therefore, the church, the early church, was filled with the Holy Spirit because the only people in the church are those willing to lay down their life for what they believe in. It's a very pure church back then. And so there was not many tares growing up with the wheat. And uh, so this is powerful. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and they'll take every worldly means to try to put it asunder just like Herod was doing here if I just kill the leaders everybody will lose heart right if I just kill the leaders they'll stop speaking in the name of Jesus and all the Jews will love me that's what Herod's agenda was we see that in verse 3 we just read it was to gain the approval of he saw that having James put to death with the sword verse 3 he saw that this met with approval among the Jews he's a he's a political leader and and so therefore he was a shrewd politician that's what he cared about and so he he wanted the Jews and the Jews wanted the disciples to stop speaking in the name of Jesus That was their issue. And they were not going to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. They were willing to give up everything for that too. Now, let the testimony of the persecuted church and the martyrs, you got to let it speak to you. Okay? We must let them speak to us their testimony or we'll be lost. The church needs the testimony and witness of the martyrs like James. So what can we learn? Number one is this. Faith always triumphs because it is married to the will of God. Faith always triumphs because it is wed to The will of God. And so if it is the will of God, Jesus surrendered to the will of God in the garden. By faith, trusting in his Father's will. And it led him to overcome death and this world. Faith, John said, uh, John who is James' brother, wrote later, faith is the victory that overcomes this world. When John wrote that, most all of the apostles were, had been martyrs but him. And he says this, faith is the victory that overcomes this world. Why? Because faith is always wedded to the will of God in Christ Jesus, and may the will of God be done. That's how we've been taught to pray. And so this is it, no matter what that is, in every aspect of life. Um, So, live by faith. Now, if we live by the senses and our own understanding, you will be terrified and depressed at what, what you see. But God will strengthen your faith and revive your soul if you live by faith in every circumstance. And that's why when Peter was put in prison, chained between two soldiers, facing being beheaded the next day as Herod maximizes the effect with the crowd. What's Peter doing? (laughs) In Acts chapter 12, he's sound asleep. Chained between two soldiers. I mean, Brenda... He's so asleep, an angel appears to him in the full-orbed glory of God, in the light of God, and Peter's still asleep. Here's what the angel does. 
He pokes him in the side to awaken him. When Peter awakens, he's still in the stupor of sleep. Why? Because faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And so when faith is always wed to the will of God, and the will of God will always bring strength to the soul and peace. So he's, uh, the angel leads him out, and really Peter doesn't completely get awake and come to himself after the angel leaves him. And so one in that age uh, gave his life for Christ. Another one was delivered from this for a time. Peter did ultimately, uh, was martyred for for his witness to Christ. Let that speak to us about their faith. Folks, you can put faith in this world, but I'll tell you what, it's fading and it will always let you down. The approval of men will always let you down. The safety and security that you find in your beloved home, in this life, in this world, will always let you down. Why? One day it'll be gone. And how secure is it? That's not any security. So let this witness speak to us. Hallelujah. Not to live by our senses, which means through our sight and our own understanding. They only, it'll always bring trouble and anxiety to you. The wicked tremble at the rustling of a leaf. But the righteous stand firm forever. And this is what they are doing. So, number one, what are we to do with that attitude? Keep our focus on being gospel-centered, mission-driven people. That's who they are. Don't get sidetracked. Do not get sidetracked into the fightings of this world, the temporal matters of this world. Don't get sidetracked off into it. Keep your focus. It's all about the gospel for the people in Acts. It's all about what Jesus says, be why witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and that's what their focus was. When people received Christ as their Savior, they formed Christian communities who, were, who uh, believed in Jesus, loved Jesus, loved the Word of God, and loved each other. It's an awesome thing. And so they kept the focus on seeing people get saved and gathered into the church. And so that's why it says in verse, um, verse 12, verse 1, about this time the king Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. They belonged to Christ, the body of Christ, his church. And so the gates of hell will not prevail against her no matter what the world does. It'll only, it'll only um, prove to work out for the gospel to be proclaimed even more boldly. Now, back in Acts chapter 4, when the Jews were persecuting them directly in the Sanhedrin, um, Peter and John, they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You can talk about God all you want to. It's still the same today. But in the name of Jesus, you see, that's what they were speaking. That's what they were teaching. They were proclaiming Gotten, and look, at what, which is right? Peter and John replied to the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about, see, verbal witness, what we have seen and heard. These apostles and others like Philip and Stephen, they were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, and they were giving witness as they took the word. So they couldn't help stop believing. When people are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't stop going about your day gospel-centered, gospel-minded, saying this. I'm in a situation here, like at work. People know who I am. People know I'm identified with as, as a Christian. How can I make Jesus shine? How can I make Christ shine, be lifted up, make him famous in the world? That I live in wherever I go whatever venue I'm called to be in whatever platform God has given me in my mind is using that in the way that I conduct myself in a Christ-like manner for the praise and the glory of God in my work my life my witness and then Lord help open just crack a door and I'm ready to speak Lord and let everybody uh, hear about the hope that I have in Jesus 
So keeping our focus on being a gospel-centered, mission-driven people and then earnestly praying for our brothers and sisters who are in trouble. This is what the church does. And so the next verse there in verse 5 says this. So Peter was kept in prison, but, see, the church was earnestly praying to God for them. And so everybody that writes on this verse is going to focus on earnestly there because it is a strong word. A Greek word that he uses there called ektenis literally means stretching of a muscle to its limits. When you pray earnestly for someone, you're praying for them with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that isn't that the first commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. You love somebody like they love Peter. They're going to love Peter with their heart, soul, mind, and strength and come before God and bring him there and ask for God's mercy and deliverance. That's what we do. It's who we are. When one of our number is in trouble, that's what happens. And when that part of us is engaged, heaven listens. Uh, God many times says, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt and I've come to deliver them. And this is what happened here with Peter praying earnestly. It reminded me of James chapter 5 verse 16, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. This community of faith is real. It's loving. It's grace-filled. It's, it's honest. Then it says this, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous month, man availeth much. So they availed themselves upon the Lord earnestly in praying to, it, to their limits of their being. God heard their prayer. And in Acts chapter 12, delivers Peter miraculously by an angel of the Lord from prison and then he goes and presents himself to the church and the church is so excited they can't believe it and uh, it's a great reunion uh, God reveals himself through prayer prayer is also the seed of the church uh, just like martyrdom and so what will God do when he hears those prayers when he sees the faithfulness of his people, let's take a look at the scriptures. Acts chapter 12, the same chapter at the end. Something happens. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, Herod was given a big speech in Caesarea. Because Herod did not give praise to God. See, the Antichrist doesn't give praise to God. He gives glory to himself, to man. It goes back to Babylon, Babylon rising. All right. An angel of the Lord struck him down. Last week we talked about whoever exalts himself will be, will be humbled. And eventually this happened to Herod. And he was eaten by worms and died. But what continued to flourish? The word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ continued to flourish. Why? It lasts forever. And it's going to produce fruit in season and out of season, summer, winter, fall, and spring, it's going to flourish no matter pandemic or not, no matter if uh, persecution happens or not. God's Word will produce in us uh, because it's alive and always effectual. Also, First Peter, Peter writes, the one who's been delivered here, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed. You see, Herod's glory fell that day. But of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. Nobody can kill the Word of God. The Word of God is living. Nobody can pass a law against it and stop it. Nobody can put it in prison. It's living and enduring it's eternal. For all people are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word preached to you. And see, this is what they were preaching. 
the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What they had heard and seen Uh, is Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead, appeared to them and taught them for 40 days before ascending then to the right hand of the Father. And Jesus' works continue because he sent his spirit into the church and continues to do his work through the body of Christ, and that is us. The word of the Lord, let it continue to be preached and spread throughout the world, and then Jesus will come. Jesus will come when there's disciples from every nation, tribe, and language on the face of the earth. And this is our mission. We're on it. We're just passing through this world. We're on a work permit. We're not home. We're on a work permit about our master's business until he does what? Until he calls us home. Some of you have worked out of town often. You know what it's like. You know you're in that town not to see the tourist spaces, although you may take a little jaunt or something from time to time. You're on their own business. Maybe you've got frequent flyer miles. And you know what's in your mind? I'm here on work. I'm glad I got work. I'm going to get my work done, then I'm going to go where? I'm going to go home where I belong, where the people love me and where I am who I am. My identity is my home, not out there in my home. This is what it's like for the believer in the Lord Jesus. Jesus doesn't want us to live for our life in this world but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust will destroy. Can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God. So persecution clarifies what we believe, refines our faith, purifies the church, and emboldens disciples to share the word and give witness to the truthfulness of the gospel. And here we see the word of the Lord lasts forever. God's word's eternal. It will flourish in every season. The Bible doesn't say it will produce fruit only in certain circumstances. No. No. There's nothing the world that can do to stop the word of God from producing fruit and life and love and peace and joy. That's what It does when the living and word comes into our heart. Now, now what we have to go through for that to be effectual is oftentimes mourning and brokenness and pain so that that our own strength can be worked out and the strength of the word fortify us. Strength of God. This is what the Word brings. And so that's why it's called upon tears at night, joy in the morning. Tears at night, seeing the old man dismantled. Coming to what it is, nothing. So that the new man may emerge. It's eternal. (laughs) And nothing can take what God has given it from him. The joy of the Lord is his strength. Peace of God passes understanding. Nobody can pass a law against that. And so that's what we see Christ doing in our life, but it's, it's formed in us by his word. And so if we're shaped by the word, think about this, if we're shaped by the word, then what we become And what we do will last forever. It will last because the redemption that's been brought and paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ has brought the Spirit to us who has the sword that brings forth this power to us who believe. So be shaped by it. Be formed by it. And whatever is formed in you by the word will last forever. 
Whatever is of your flesh will fall and die and be no more. What vain part of your personality, what, what fleshly part of what we do in life, living out of the senses, will pass away. It won't, won't last. But that which is a fruit of being conformed by the, to the Word, to God, to, to whatever we do that the Word of God has called us to do in obedience to the Word, will last forever. That's why we call it a rock. It will endure. What you become and what you do, if shaped by the Word, will last forever. Now, folks, the Word of God is not a philosophy of life. It really isn't. The Bible doesn't say that. It's not a philosophy of life to live by. The Word of God is a revelation of God to you that you may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings so that you may become transformed by your knowledge of God and be like Him. This is revelation. And this revelation is saying to everyone in Christ crucified, I love you. And you're in a precarious situation. Your sins condemn you. But I bore your sins so that you might be forgiven. That's the word of the Lord to you through Christ Jesus. He offers the forgiveness of sins for everyone who repents of your sins and believes on Jesus. Surrender your life to Him. He'll save you completely and forevermore and then give you His Holy Spirit and the Word that will then be the power to conform you over time to the image of His Son, restoring in us the image of God. If you've never made a decision for Christ, I pray that you would begin today by turning from your sins and placing your trust in Jesus that you may be saved. That's where it begins. And then, then you can understand the Word because the Spirit will open your eyes to the wonderful revelation of who He is and who you are in Christ. And may the Lord bless you.
Good morning. Got a couple announcements for you guys this morning. Uh, number one, next week, uh, after the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have a business meeting. Um, we've got quite a few things, actually, to vote on as a church. So if you want to be involved in the uh, business side of the church, I want to encourage you to uh, either stay after the 11 o'clock service or come back uh, to the business meeting. The next and more exciting announcement is we're going to do Easter the way we've always done Easter. Um, so we, uh, yeah, uh, we're going to do sunrise service out here in the back parking lot. It will look a little different. We'll have the sh uh, chair socially distanced. Will there be groups of well, there'll be single chairs, there'll be groups of two, there'll be groups of three, and you can move chairs if you have a larger family than that. But we're looking forward to that. Jeff Hoagland has agreed to get a team together to serve breakfast. Uh, we learned from the ladies' event that it can be done safely. We're going to, or they, the, the guys cooking breakfast, are going to package it uh, in some uh, to-go containers, and we'll have those ready. So uh, we will be taking steps to... Uh, to do this safely, but we're going to do it. So uh, looking forward to that. And finally, I don't know if you noticed or not, as you were coming in, we had ushers, but they didn't necessarily seat you. You guys know the drill by now. We're all adults. Uh, and we're going to dismiss you the same way. So when I say amen, if you will just dismiss yourselves accordingly, we would greatly appreciate it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to you this morning. We thank you. We praise you, we worship you, we love you. We thank you for providing for us. We thank you for your son Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross. And it's to him, as Pastor Jake preached, that we strive to be like, that we need to conform to, and we ask for your help in that, so that we can be your instrument, your tool to, uh, to bring honor and glory to your name to build your kingdom on this earth so father we do ask for your help in that father go with us through the week help us to be a light uh, for you it's in jesus holy and precious name we pray